here's something that lots of people don't realise about medieval axes. Hi folks, Matt Eaton here, Scholar Gladiatory. Now, this is a relatively simple thing and should be a, a pretty concise video for me to do, but it's a simple point to do with the construction of axes. Now, most people think they know about the construction of axes because axes are still something that's around in the modern world, and so they therefore think that if they're going to make a replica of a medieval axe, then what they do is they make the head, the shape of a medieval axe, and they construct it by and large in the same way as a modern axe. But the problem with that is it's assuming lots of information about the past, without actually going and studying the artefacts. Now, we've actually got quite a lot of axes um, surviving archaeologically um, and in museums and such like. And the fact is that when these are found uh, in the ground, for example, if they're found with any remnants of their shaft whatsoever, they are not normally found with metal wedges at the end. Now, notice I said metal wedges, and I'll come back to that in a minute. Uh, but quite simply, the way that most axes in the modern world are constructed is the head is narrowed, the um, axe head itself is put, sorry, the shaft is narrowed, the head is put down on the top, and then wedges are hammered in at the top. Now, you will notice this is a rather excessive example. I don't think I've ever seen so many wedges hammered into the top of a shaft before. Maybe you have. Have you seen this many? Have you seen more? Uh, comments below. Um, but while the head is ish, uh, historical-ish in shape, although I would say that the eye is rather round in this particular example, not to say that there aren't axes with round eyes, in fact there are, um, particularly in Slavic areas of Europe and also uh, in India as well and Persia and other places of the world. So we do find uh, round eyes, but it's not very typical, for example, in uh, France, England, Scandinavia, Germany. Usually an eye is at least oval or some other kind of shape that uh, means that it can't revolve on the shaft and means that the shaft isn't necessarily round. Oh, another example of a round eye, um, you can find them on uh, Zulu uh, axes, various African axes actually have round eyes, and um, also Native American tomahawks. Although a lot of those were European made, obviously they were made to the wishes, to some degree anyway, to the wishes of uh, Native Americans, and some of those have round eyes. But I'll talk a bit more about tomahawks in a second. So that's the normal way of construction, is the head is put down on the shaft, the uh, wedges are then uh, uh, hammered into the top, which um, spreads out the top and holds it uh, completely rigid and solid. It's a very tried and tested way of attaching a head to a shaft. But... It is not how lots of medieval axe shafts are actually uh, put onto the shaft. Now, there are two ways that we often uh, find, or we've got some evidence for, for medieval axes being put onto the shafts. The first one is with a wedge that's made of wood. Now, what's interesting is I have an axe here from um, uh, Thor's Forge, same um, towards same guy that makes the Dane axes, which feature a lot on my channel. And here you will see that the head has been brought down from below. Okay, so you can see that the shaft is actually slightly thinner here than it is here. So the head has been put down on the top, but then there is a, um, uh, a slot, essentially, a wedge cut out of the shaft, and then a wooden wedge is hammered in from the top. Now, archaeologically, there's been actually quite a lot of discussion about this uh, archaeologically, because particularly for the Viking era and the earlier migration era, we find a lot of axes found in situ in the ground, sometimes in graves, particularly pre-Christian graves. We find uh, certain types of Francisca and uh, Longobard axes and so on and so forth found in the ground. And the big question is, how was the sh uh, shaft attached to the head? And one, uh, bearing in mind there is no remnants whatsoever. We've got the metal head, we have no wooden shaft, but there is no metal wedge, so we know they weren't using metal wedges. So this is one possible solution, that they did use a wedge, and they used a wedge made of wood. Uh, and therefore when it decays in the ground, there'd be no metal wedge left. So that absolutely is one way of achieving the same goal without using metal wedges. Um, and uh, we can, I think we can say with some degree of certainty that this was probably done some of the time. However, despite this, lots of modern replicators of medieval axes use a metal wedge in the end, just like this one here. This is a more typical one wedge. you notice this is the opposite direction to the other example I showed here. 
So here's here the two compared. In both cases, they have uh, put metal wedges in the end, but in a different way. This one, rather excessive. It's actually split the shaft. It's just horrible. This is tidier done, um, and uh, but in the opposite direction. Uh, which is, is that more conventional? I think that's the more conventional way of doing it. But, uh, but anyway, and you'll notice this has got a more uh, sort of teardrop shaped um, eye to the socket. So you could say that this is more historically correct for most of medieval Europe, but we've got a metal wedge there and we don't really have much evidence of metal wedges used in medieval Europe, um, certainly not found archeologically. So people continue doing it that way because that's the way that they're familiar with. But there's one often overlooked style of construction that doesn't require a metal wedge, doesn't require a wooden wedge. And I have here an Indian axe, which you may recognize from my wall at the back there. It's been up there for quite some time. And this type of axe is called a boulevard axe and um, used in certain parts of India, northern India. And um, this is a very interesting example. Now, just to note very briefly, actually, the shaft of this is round and the eye of it is round, so there are circular, absolutely there are circular eyes to certain types of uh, socket and shaft. But this is not wedged in place. Uh, in fact, you'll notice this has a sort of ornamental and partly functional point on the uh, tip of the shaft. Um, now, this is actually put on instead from the top end, it's put on from the bottom end. Now, some of you will be familiar with this form of construction, perhaps from uh, pickaxes or mattocks, certain tools are like this. Um, so if you look at a pickaxe handle, it just basically gets wider and wider and wider towards the end. And so you put the head on from the bottom end and then you go bang, bang on the ground and the head should stay where it is. You can wedge underneath uh, if you need to, uh, if you're worried about the thing sliding down towards your hands, but usually just hammering it up there is enough. Now this we know has been done all over the world with axes at various points. Remember that when you're swinging the item, the inertia is that direction, uh, so that will hold the head on. And if the, if the end of the shaft is swollen and bigger than the eye of the socket, then the head can't come off. The only danger you possibly have is that it could slide back down towards your hand if it's hit from the other end or somehow the wood of the shaft contracts, gets dried out or something like that, who knows. Um, but th so that is a risk. Um, now, this, where was this done, this form of construction? Numerous Indian axes, lots of Asian axes, including this Indian example here, Persian axes, and indeed in Europe it was done. We know that it was done with certain European axes and there's a lot of debate about whether this was potentially done some of the time with so-called Dane axes or great axes. Um, we actually don't know a huge amount about how they were secured. That being said, some of these do have brass or copper sleeves underneath the socket. And it seems at least in that case, they were probably wedged from the top, probably with a wooden um, wedge because there's no evidence of a metal wedge being there. So, um, but there is also in um, Ireland, I believe, there are some bog found um, axes. So some of you may know that there are bogs in Ireland where organic material gets preserved, kind of mummified basically, and doesn't um, rot away like it does in the ground normally. And so we have prehistoric animals um, preserved in, in bogs or parts of them, like antlers and stuff. But equally, we've got, um, we've got weapons and tools. And some of those axes found in Ireland do indeed, the shaft swells all the way up to the top, so the head is put on from the bottom. And the other famous, as I mentioned, the other famous example of this being done is the Native American tomahawk. So most Native American tomahawks of the typical shapes are the head is put on from the butt end, um, so from the uh, bottom end down here, and then it slides up to the top. You bang, 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 so it's nice and tight on the wood, and it can't come flying off the end because the shaft up here is thicker than the shaft down here, and the eye is uh, too small to get off the end of the shaft there. So there we go, hopefully, and it's as simple as that really, hopefully a few takeaways from this video. Number one, um, metal wedges in the end of the shaft are archeologically speaking of dubiously evidenced uh, and probably weren't the main way for fixing ax heads in medieval Europe. And equally, they don't seem to have been the predominant way of fixing ax heads really until, uh, until the modern industrial age. And it does seem that most ax heads around the world either have a wooden wedge on the top, perhaps sometimes another organic material like horn or antler, uh, 
but some kind of wedge of organic material in the top that doesn't survive archaeologically. Or, and this is the, I think, the commonly, you know, overlooked and not widely known constructional method, the head was simply put on from the butt end and wedged by virtue of the shaft getting fatter towards the end. That will incidentally result in the shaft looking fatter above here than below here, which I think to some people's eyes looks a bit odd because in the modern world we're not used to it. One final detail to mention, if you use this type of sliding up construction method, much, much like a pickaxe handle, whilst the top of the shaft might be fatter up here than it is down here, you usually have to have some form of flare out on the wood down here so that your hand can't just slide off the end. Because if that is like a giant carrot or cone, your hand is gonna to want to slide off the end of that tool or weapon in use. And so what you do is you make it thin down here and then just at the last bit, you just flare out enough, not so much that you can't get the head over it, uh, but just enough to stop the hand easily sliding off the end. And there we go. I hope that's been interesting and useful to some of you. I hope I'll see you back on the channel again soon for another video. Cheers for watching, folks. Thanks for watching. We've got extra videos on Patreon. Please give our Facebook a like and subscribe if you haven't already. Cheers, folks.